Um, today we have with us uh, James Lang from Figure, Ari Lee, um, Felicia Davis, and Minga Opazo, um, Mira Henry from Current Interests uh, in Architectural Practice here in LA um, is unfortunately sick and um, will not be joining us this morning. Uh, and then um, Casey Baden, a uh, textile artist, will be joining us a little late, um, but hopefully uh, I think she'll make it in time to give uh, her presentation. So today we'll be starting um, with a very quick round robin, uh, sort of Pecha Kucha style round robin of presentations from all of our guest presenters. Um, and that will then be followed by a break room session. Uh, we wanted to provide an opportunity for everyone to be able to maybe engage with fellow audience members, um, as well as perhaps a speaker if they're randomly shuffled into a, a break room with you. And that will be about a 15 minute break or so to share reflections, um, share a bit about where each of you are coming from. Uh, and I also want to um, maybe prompt you all to kind of share questions that you may have and to refine them and workshop them with each other for our Q&A session that will follow afterward. Um, so I'll very quickly just give a few brief bios um, in order of presentation of our speakers. Um, James uh, Lang is here from Figure. Figure is a San Francisco-based architecture collective. Yeah, everyone feel free to like wave. <laughs> um, Figure is a San Francisco-based architecture collective led by James um, and Jennifer Lee. Their work explores relationships between art, architecture, and community, and their current interests include unexpected materials, dollhouses, and rocks. Um, James and Jennifer uh, also lecture at UC Berkeley, and they are the artists who um, are behind the wonderful installation that's currently up at Craft Contemporary um, in the courtyard through September uh, 12th, and we'll be hearing more about that. Um, after James, Ari will be presenting. Um, Ari is a multidisciplinary artist who works in video, new media, and textiles. Um, her work has been shown at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, LA Municipal Art Gallery, um, 01 SJ Biennial, and the Orange County Center for Contemporary Art, um, and Sundance Channel. Um, and very recently, she was a resident over at the Feminist Center for Creative Work. Um, Felicia Davis um, works in computational textiles, uh, questioning how we live as she reimagines re how we might use textiles in our daily lives and in architecture. Um, she will, I'm sure, explain computational textiles a lot better than I will in this brief introduction. Um, so I'll leave that to her. Uh, Felicia also teaches over at Penn State. Um, and then after Felicia, uh, we'll hear from Minga. Uh, Minga Opazo is a fourth generation textile crafter who explores the relationship between climate change, contemporary textile production, and Chilean textile history and design. Um, born in Chile, Minga immigrated to LA um, when she was 16 uh, and recently completed her MFA at CalArts. Um, Minga has exhibited uh, internationally at the Museum of Visual Art, Santiago, Chile, CAM Gallery, Acre, uh, Architectural Foundation of Santa Barbara, and Mac Center. Um, and then Casey Baden, who we will meet in a bit, is a multidisciplinary artist, also working with textiles, text, natural dye, um, photography, painting, weaving, and clay. Um, she hails from Texas uh, and also completed her MFA at CalArts in 2020 and with Minga recently co-founded an up-and-coming fiber resource center, which we will hear more about called Textile Resource LA. Um, Andres, I don't know if there's anything you would like to add. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that encompasses um, everything. But hello, everyone. My name is 
Andres Bayan Estrada. I am the curator of public engagement at Craft Contemporary. Uh, and I think overall, I would like, I, I would like to thank everyone again uh, for attending today's program. And also thank you to m and for, for working on putting this program together and for all the work and all the time that you all put into the fabulous installation that is up in the courtyard right now. If you haven't been there, uh, please uh, take some time to go visit the installation and really take, make some time to, to spend some time in there. It's a quite beautiful space um, and thank you for for James and Figure for, for working on that. And thank you all. And I will be dropping into the link, the link to the Craft Contemporaries website and our Instagram. If you don't know us, we're an institution that has been in Los Angeles for about over 50 years, focusing specifically on contemporary craft uh, and the expansion of what craft is. Uh, so hope to see you at some point at the museum. And thank you, m and and thank you, Kate. And everyone who's here. <laughs> For presenting today. All right, um, James, we'll let you take it away then. All right, uh, let me share my screen. Can everyone see my screen and hear me okay? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Great. Um, uh, um, first of all, uh, thank you, Kay, Andres, um, uh, everyone from m and and uh, Craft Contemporary for, for uh, having me. And um, it's a delight to be able to talk about our project and also uh, engage in conversation with um, uh, all the other artists today. Um, I put together a short uh, presentation of the project and um, in the spirit of informality, it really is just a almost unfiltered uh, uh, feed from my iPhone uh, for, from the last two years. Um, that's how long this project has, has taken. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a bit sort of visual bombardment. Um, I'll have you know, maybe four or five seconds per slide. Um, so get ready. Um, but before I begin, um, you know, Veilcraft is a project that is very much about uh, a material uh, and a technique associated with that. Um, uh, and uh, just some quick takeaways that um, we gleaned from the process of making the project. Um, uh, you know, coming from a position of real uh, naivete, this, this is this project was is very unorthodox for um, for us coming from a more traditional uh, uh, practice of architecture. So the relationship between us as the designer and the final product uh, it was quite unique. Um, so for us, um, you know craft and specifically textile craft uh, is iterative. There was a lot of trial and error. It's very labor intensive. We were actually doing the labor. Um, it favors physical prototyping over documentation um, and also simulation. So you'll see a lot of physical prototyping. Um, it requires access to spaces of reduction. Um, so that is, uh, you know, uh, kind of privilege and, and it requires resources to acquire that. Um, uh, it's navigating around adjacent bodies um, because uh, the, the, the courtyard of the craft itself was already full of history and full of uh, things um, that we had to uh, navigate around. Um, requires real time decisions. Um, can't really plan everything ahead of time. Uh, a lot of in the field uh, design decisions uh, needed to be made. Um, it's really messy. Um, and it's also uh, about accepting imperfections, sometimes um, hiding them, sometimes celebrating them. Um, so with that, uh, you'll see tidbits of these um, things as I uh, fire through the, the um, stream of images. And so, uh, physical model made almost uh, two years to the day uh, um, ago. Um, 
first ideas of what Bellcraft might be. This is, um, these are our first model. This is our first model of the project. Um, bringing it down to LA to show the scaffolding vendor, uh, looking at their stock of uh, construction textiles, getting material samples, um, beginning to make our first uh, full scale prototype, um, seeing how the fabric uh, performs opacity transparency um, in our first office space. So many, many, many uh, prototype. Um, you know, uh, physical prototyping was the most effective tool, but we, we were still using digital tools as well to uh, try to visualize certain effects, um, spatial organization. Um, site visits uh, that reveal uh, strange conditions, um, but you know, also full of opportunity in how our installation would engage those uh, strange moments. Um, we were hanging, we began hanging fabric uh, basically everywhere. This was this is this was our second office, office our office space at the time. Um, and this is my apartment. Uh, so uh, the threshold between workspace and domestic space um, became increasingly blurred. And of course, this was during the pandemic as well. So um, our homes became the spaces of uh, mocking up and fabrication uh, for, for a good few months. Um, prototyping at one to one, but also at a model scale. Um, this is one of our team members, Tiger, working on a, a half inch was a foot model. We were testing material properties uh, um, at this scale as well. Um, various scales and types of approximations. Um, we had sewing machines uh, uh, and all sorts of other textile tools that um, we were using for the first time. So it was very much about uh, learning the, the limitations, you know, the opportunities that these tools gave us. And you know, at that time also um, beginning to uh, reconceptualize the project a little bit because the first iterations of the design uh, were produced pre-pandemic um, in 2019. And so that year in which there was a lull, um, we had time to think more about um, the way the project was produced in terms of labor and, and also the techniques um, that we were to use. Ultimately, um, we, uh, we um, decided on the pleat as the primary um, XL technique that would be deployed across uh, the installation and in the courtyard. And so this, we eventually got a production space for larger uh, mock-ups. And this is us testing that um, technique at um, horizontally and vertically. Um, a lot of um, iPhone sketch-based uh, uh, notations during the design process. Um, approximating that beam in the courtyard, how fabric could move around it. Um, mocking up the pleat in model, uh, model scale. Um, and documenting that. And then finally, uh, going into production and bringing all of this down to Los Angeles. I, I should say that we're based in San Francisco, so all of this was done in San Francisco and then transported down to Los Angeles. Um, also thinking about the, the second light, the acrylic of this uh, fabric, 
what could become after the installation finishes. And so uh, once we were in the field, things happened very quickly. Um, required a lot of design decisions, a lot of uh, sketching in field. Uh, it took less than 72 hours for um, and to, for the scaffolding vendor to evacuate the scaffolding portion. And then at that point, our team came in and started the fabric install. Hey, James, can yeah. you're coming through a tiny bit choppy. Um, can you maybe turn your mic off and turn it back on just to see if that might reset things? I don't know if that will help. That, I don't know if it's any better, but I don't really need to speak either. Um, I think it's a tiny bit better, but um, yeah, let's just keep going because I think the images are wonderful and maybe we can troubleshoot when other people are presenting. Yeah, I think I can um, put on my headphones and that'll be better. And so these are just images during the install. <clears throat> James, I think maybe if you turned off your video, it might help your internet connection and then the audio could continue your, your audio. Okay. okay. Yeah. Maybe, hopefully that's better. Um, okay, and just to finish up with some final uh, images of the of the courtyard uh, in its completed state. Um, there's a little bit frozen, so I think we can we could probably just end on this image then. Um, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much, James. Um, we're going to move on to Ari. Um, and just so uh, everyone in the audience knows, we want to really just like flood the space with lots of images, lots of ideas. So we're going to hold conversation um, to after these uh, very quick presentations. Um, and so uh, next up, Ari. Hi, everyone. I am looking for my presentation, which somehow has disappeared from my selections. Let me try this again. Here we go. All right, can everybody see my screen? Awesome. Algorithms are at the heart of my method in that they are sets of repetitive steps to solve a problem or accomplish a task, whether I'm coding them to render computational videos or following rule-based manual processes that I set for myself. This video uses an algorithm to reshuffle faces into an ever-changing pattern. How is the sound? Is everyone hearing me all right? So-so? Okay. Perfect. When I learned... When I learned a few years ago that the design of the first computers comes from the same technology that runs jacquard weaving looms, and that the first computer program is written by a woman, something clicked. The following body of work examined the connections between looms and computers, craft and code. Weavings are made by holding a series of threads taut and weaving another thread over and under them, the warp and the weft. 
You can see that at any point on the weaving, either the warp thread is, thread is on top or the weft thread is on top. It's analogous to a one or a zero in a computer bit. In the early 1800s, Joseph Marie Jacquard exploited this binary nature of weavings to create the punch card driven mechanism <clears throat> to automate the lifting of the threads to make complex patterns. Meanwhile, the English inventor Charles Babbage was working on the design for what he called the analytical engine, which turned out to be the design for the very first computer. Babbage was inspired by Jacquard's loom and thought that punch cards would be an ideal method of inputting information into the analytical engine. He saw that the binary nature of weaving that the Jacquard mechanism exploited corresponded to the binary nature of computing. The punched hole in the Jacquard punch card could be considered the origin computer bit. Ace was a friend and collaborator of Charles, Charles Babbage. Born in 1815 in London as a daughter of English romantic poet Byron, she was highly educated and excelled in math and science, which was unusual for women at that time. She wrote a computer program for the analytical engine, the very first computer program. My piece Ada reunites weaving and computers through the form of the punch card. In the notes in which her first computer program appeared, Lovelace made an astute observation on the potential of computers and wrote, we may say most aptly that the analytical engine weaves algebraic patterns just as the Jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. This is the secret message that I encoded into my weaving. So let's turn from the 19th century to the 20th. The technology industry is now heavily male dominated, but it didn't start out that way. The teams puzzling out how to program the first computers like ENIAC were mostly women. And women graduating from college with math degrees in the 1950s reaped the benefit of a new boom in workplaces meeting computer programmers. There are no preconceptions as to who was best suited for this new field of work. And in fact, since women had already been doing calculations as human computers for decades, it seemed like a natural progression. Women's perceived patience, perseverance, and fastidiousness were seen as making them ideal computer programmers. So recruiters look for skills such as knitting or cooking precisely from a cookbook. It's hard to imagine Facebook or Google seeking those skill sets today. In fact, the reversal in female dominance in computer programming that began in the 1980s is so complete that as recently as 2017, only 20% 20 of technical roles at Google were held by women. Disrupting the industry depicts the rise and fall of the percentage of computer science bachelor's degrees earned by women in 19, from 1966 through 2010. There's a peak at 1984, marked in this weaving by a band of copper wire. Then the curve drops precipitously to a level close in 1966. In 1984, the Apple Macintosh was released, which many fathers bought for their sons to work on together. And movies like War Games, and Revenge of the Nerds popularized the image of the nerdy teenage boy hacker, perhaps turning girls away from computing. At the same time, new enrollment caps on computer science majors around the country limited enrollment to those who had already had computer experience. In most cases, boys who grew up with personal computers. My title, Disrupting the Industry, is taken from technology startup pitches in which they claim their app will disrupt the industry, like Uber disrupting the taxi industry or Amazon disrupting shopping. Disruption is so highly valued in tech culture that this conference, which awards prizes to startups, is called Disrupt. In any other context, like a classroom, disruption is discouraged. But in Silicon Valley, it's rewarded with venture capital money. The perception of what makes a good computer programmer and who belongs in that role has turned 180 degrees from patient, fastidious women to disruptive hacker dudes in just a few decades. In my last body of work, I sought to bust the myth that technology began with computers and, that's, and that it's always been the domain of men. In my current work in progress, I'm creating the mythology of the world I want to see. A weaving series in progress, Motherboard, compares the functional and aesthetic qualities of Bauhaus weavings and computer motherboards. The women of the Bauhaus weaving workshop elevated their craft from mere aesthetic pictures made of wool to designing highly functional materials meeting the requirements of industrial production. Conversely, computer motherboards, whose layouts are optimized for the most efficient connections between components, are etched and emblazoned with copper and gold. Material is considered decorative in other contexts and are arranged in patterns evoking classic Bauhaus weavings. 
I'm exploring this interplay of function and form by teaching myself double weave, a weaving structure fundamental to Bauhaus workshop and using it to begin to close the gap between textiles and technology, form and function, craft and design. Most recently, I began exploring e-textiles, weaving with conductive thread and microprocessors to create soft electronics, which I'm sure we'll hear more about from Alicia, uh, Felicia. Despite the increased fluidity of gender expectations and roles in society today, weaving and coding remain strongly gendered. We tend to think of craft and technology as two opposing concepts, but the root of the word technology is the Greek techni, which means art or craft. Technology is craft. Through this new work, I reclaim weaving as a computational activity and reframe computing as a craft, reuniting these two sides of the same coin and declaring that technology belongs to everyone. Thanks, Ari. Um, and I think that's a perfect segue uh, to Felicia's presentation. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. All right. Um, yeah, thanks to um, both the presenters that have gone before. I think we'll have a very rich and interesting conversation. Um, thank you to materials and application as well for the opportunity um, to share some work. Today, I am in upstate New York on the lands that were owned by the Lenape people. And so um, I'm gonna speak about something a little bit different than everyone has been expecting with computational textiles. But since Kate asked, I will give a quick definition. Um, the way we um, use it in our lab, which is soft lab at Penn State University, um, we call computational textiles textiles that are either woven, knitted, or they can be pounded fibers or felt um, woven together with electronics and other microcontrollers embedded in them. And then we use them to communicate through their transformation to people. So that's how we use um, the definition of computational textiles. Um, but today, what I'd like to talk about, it's a little bit different, so I'm gonna take you someplace else. Um, when we talk about textiles using photographs, we're seeing with our eyes but our neurons in our brains are already firing because of similar experiences we've had in our lives prior to seeing this photo, for example. And we're able to understand to some extent what it would be like to experience that texture in this photograph through touch, even though we're not touching it. So the particular example that you saw before we use is a stretch sensor so we can connect it to other devices so that it can be used to, for example, to measure someone's breathing or other um, things that people want to measure. In our lab, um, as designers, we've been asking, how can we communicate through touch using the aesthetics of touch, shape, texture, softness, color, movement, and pressure. And so communication for our purposes means sending an intentional message or information through an aesthetic expression. So if we're not using words or abstract and learned units of meaning, such as you know spelling with words or braille, for example, how can we get a message or connect to people? Um, in soft lab, we've been trying to understand what emotions are communicated to people via touch or nonverbal emotional language. So in work that we've been doing, looking at the relationship between vision and touch to communicate, um, we've used textures and emotion of textures related to animal fur, feathers, and their skins, um, which have different behaviors that reflect their position 
and emotional states in an environment. And typically when a human sees an animal in an environment, they're not necessarily communicating to you in the hardcore sense that I just presented to you, but they're really, we can take away information from that and infer that they're either scared or that they're proud or that they are a little bit angry, right? The bird ruffles its feathers um, when it's a little bit angry. So the purpose of this is to evoke and elicit emotional experiences that people may have seen in animals to communicate with them through their memory. Um, these textures that you're looking at here all are made of felt and have motility. In other words, they each move, but in a slow way, similar to an animal breathing. So let's see if I can get this video going and I may have to skip it forward and backwards a little bit because in the interest of time. When you touch something, you are in a call and response mode. Another way of saying this, as James Gibson, the psychologist said, is that you can decide to feel, to feel the dent made in your hand by a table, or you can focus on the edge of the table. And so to continue with Gibson's thoughts for our purposes today, um, touching materials creates poles of experience that place concepts of subject and object in a continuum. A person can toggle between understanding as a subject or understanding as an object that's being acted upon. So I'm gonna speed some of these up just so you can get a sense of what some of these other textures do. There's that one. Speed that up. Last one. Okay. So, one of my favorite photographs um, when I was learning a beginning kind of architect was this photograph of Lena Losis, a sensuous cloth lined bedroom with fur lined floor. And here the fur is more or less smooth, um, but we can imagine the difference in response that we would have if the fur were standing on end um, and if it had some utility. And if the curtains had sharp accordion creases and a texture as James showed in his project, veil. So we can only react here visually in this instance on Zoom, um, but certainly it evokes um, a whole series of experiences that would be changing um, through the material. The felt project, um, which we did in our lab, which is the feeling emotion linked to touch project, uh, looked at making a larger scale intervention through a standing wall panel to see what changed about emotion as the piece became larger. And here's a kind of close up of it here. And then this is it standing uh, in a gallery nearby our lab. And during the making of felt, um, one of the aspects that our lab looked at uh, were the ways in which people touch specific textiles. Ways of touch altered and changed what emotions get communicated and what experiences people had. So during the study, people ended up pinching the fabric, stroking with open palms um, on the backside of their hands, 
And literally some people really try to get the whole entire length um, of their arms and legs in the texture to, to understand what was going on with it. So, and a final thought to close um, with is from Tem Ingold, his paper, The Textility of Making in 2010. Um, and that is that a specific material makes you think about certain issues in specific ways because of the nature of that selected material. In other words, people organize their thoughts along the textures of material connections. And so these things, thinking, making um, and experiencing are all interconnected in your brain and allow you to have this kind of view that is also shaped by the materials around you. And so with that, I will conclude and um, I look forward to talking in the question and answer. Thank you. Thanks so much, Felicia. Um, we're now gonna jump over to Minga. Uh, let me share my, my screen. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, first, I want to give thanks to Andres and Kate for organizing to MA and Craft Contemporary for inviting me and Casey to this talk. We're really excited to share our work and also our new center that we're working on. Um, so yeah, um, I want to start with this image. This is one of my sculptures that I'd had a, my TC show at Colors. Um, I started, I'm a four generation crafter, textile crafter, and I, I worked with a different types of weavings and more natural materials. And then when I moved to LA, I was um, very impacted by the fashion industry and how much waste we create in the fashion industry. And so I started working with recycled textiles. Um, here's a close up. And I was just to give you guys some numbers, and I'm sure you guys know or heard about it. 15% um, of the clothing that you donate to any thrift shop is actually resold, and everything else goes to the landfill. Or um, it usually the US doesn't take much of the recycling burden, and it's, it's taken to Chile and Africa. I follow the trail in Chile because I'm from there and um, the very little information that is out there, it goes to the north of Chile and it's buried or burned. There's about 10% that actually gets reused, which is great, but it's not enough. Um, if you see in the first image, those bales of clothing, I work with a, a thrift shop in Ventura and those bales of clothing are a thousand pounds each bale. And those clothing, they take at least like 10 bales out of the store every day that they ship to Chile and Africa. There's a lot of waste. So I started working with like ge geological forms and like the new fossils that we have. So this is object sculpture um, is like a solid rock and it's uh, layers and layers of clothing. So kind of working with the idea of like a new geology and like what it will be. There's already fossils in Hawaii because of the volcanic um, activity that they are already with like tons of plastic around it. So I was just trying to like work around that. This is Tita, my abuelita, and she's wearing this poncho that I made with all the tags that I've been collecting. This is an ongoing piece of all the tags that um, I collect when I make a sculpture I take the tag out and for me it's really interesting because the tag has not even like just the brand but also where it's made and you have all the politics of like where it's made where the cotton from comes from and stuff like that um here's it oh it's working um I started working about like the identity of the clothing and how it's attached very attached to our living and how it kind of takes like I I'm full part of it too like is very attached to the way that we dress is the identity that we have um, 
and so kind of like the consumerism like makes us buy so we more attached to our identity so that was going with that in that little video and then i started doing these big weavings of including the recycled clothing and also having these techniques that are very old and um this is in a in a uh, floor loom um this is oh there's another one <laughs> And then going back to the geology, um, I started thinking about how they bury the clothing in Chile and the pre-colonial textiles in Chile are very well conserved because in the north of Chile, you have the salt sea and the very driest desert in the world. So the textiles get very well like uh, conserved. So we have these beautiful textiles that were made in the pre-colonial that now they're in different museums in Europe. Um, and now, there's nothing in there They took it away from the people. And we have this like new textiles coming in and being buried in the same areas. So I started making these core samples of taking out the dirt from the, um, if you, I had like a thing and I could take out samples of the dirt and you can see the layers of clothing. Also, clothing is right now, I mean, not all of them, but if it's not hundred percent cotton and it's no naturally dye, is very toxic. It, polyester, which is the main textile that we use right now, um, has a lot of plastic in it. And so these textiles are going to take years and years to de actually decompose. Uh, some of them would never go away. Um, but I started working with a mycologist. She's Danielle Stevenson, and she's a PhD in Riverside right now. You see a Riverside. We started collaborating and we know now, and I don't know, maybe you've seen like mushrooms are very popular right now, which is great, that um, they do eat plastic, but they have to have a really very special conditions to eat the plastic. But then I came up to, to Danielle and I was like, clothing is cotton with plastic. So maybe it would be easier for the mushroom to start digesting this clothing. So all of the clothing that you see in between the mushrooms right here, are um, polyester and we're, we're working different samples right now to create a way that the mushroom will digest the clothing. We have some results like, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> we have some results that the, you see the white areas is where the mycelium is actually digesting like the, the clothing. The mushroom that comes out on the top is the fruit um, and that is, well, we're trying to figure out how toxic is the mushroom. Um, so we're sending the mushrooms to tax toxicology tests to see um, if we can put this that will become compost and our personal compost or in, like in, a, in a CD landfill compost. And if we can just digest this massive amount of waste. Um, it's not going. And there's another picture of my favorite um, little sculpture that we came up with. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about textile resource LA and I'm going to pass it to Casey and she can finish it. <laughs> Me and Casey started collaborating and uh, doing textiles in grad school. We're like the only textile girls in the, in the class. And when um, we graduated college, we wanted to start something and we had the opportunity to get a residency at the Reef Building in downtown LA. And so we created Textile Resource LA, which it will find a permanent home soon. And what we're doing is we hope to have a, a place that we can have workshops and com the community to get together. And also we did our first curated exhibition. Um, this is our Textile LA artist. And yeah, I'm gonna pass it to Casey. <laughs> uh, I need to get it. Hi, I'm gonna jump to the same screen share one second. Um, how do I do this? I'm gonna see my crazy desktop, everyone, sorry. <laughs> okay. Present. Okay, does that look right? Um, okay, hi. Um, I think, yeah, okay, so this is where Mingo was. Um, we, this is our first um, inaugural exhibition for Textile Resource LA, um, which, as she said, it was nine artists, all LA based emerging textile artists. 
And yeah, the idea of textile resource, um, hopefully to come is to like have a, a membership based studio space, um, a place where people can use the equipment, looms and tufting guns and sewing machines and maybe start a natural dye garden and sort of all of those things. There's some existing examples across the country, but nothing like of that nature exists in LA yet. So hopefully in the next year, we'll, we're sort of working on the curatorial aspect of it right now and then working towards sort of establishing a more um, robust program and a permanent place next year. Um, so this is just images of the artists that were in the first show. Um, and then this gets to my practice. Um, this is a piece that was installed at the Max Center of Art and Architecture last summer. Um, I work with textiles um, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about different kinds of um, architectural installation methods. Um, I'm interested in the domestic space and the textiles that we have at home and sort of how we're just so surrounded by them, um, but also like their, their bodily nature and their tactility and everything. So this piece was 10, um, 10 patchwork panels where I um, dyed like 90% of the fibers with natural dyes and then did the drawings and created these patchwork images to be installed in this um, geodesic dome. And the next slide is just some more details of that. And it was installed outside, which sort of gave it an element um, that I really enjoyed. You know, natural dyes aren't permanent and they fade with the light. And so this being installed outside for three weeks, um, it really like altered the nature of the images, which, um, you know, I thought was a, a really cool, just like part of its installation. Um, this is another piece that I installed in a show earlier this summer in Joshua Tree. We did a rock crevice show. Um, so this is another naturally dyed and patchwork. Oh gosh, sorry. Um, naturally dyed and patchworked piece um, installed outside. And I was thinking of it, um, you know, we're already outside, but it sort of to me works like a skylight in the opposite. Um, so the skylight inside of a home brings in the light, where in this case, this panel above of you sort of reflects, reflect, sorry, reflects the light or refracts the light and creates this like artistic piece above you. Um, and this is another patchwork piece, sort of all of the scraps left over from the first piece that I showed the, the dome. Um, this was everything that remained. So um, just putting all those pieces together and working with this like quilting and patchwork technique. Um, as I said, I'm also really interested in the body and um, its relationship to textiles and sort of the space that we're always taking up. I think a lot about just furniture and our beds and like all the places that we put our weight or have our shadows reflected and um, how that's sort of so transitory that's always shifting and always in motion. Um, so I make and the front image is a cyanotype uh, body print. And in the back piece was sort of a, I had a group of people sort of lay down together and I mapped out that shape. Um, so just thinking about the body and its relationship to these textiles. Um, and I work in a lot of different media. So I just, this was another sort of related to textiles, but not so one-to-one. Um, -one. I was making these photographs in the style of quilts. So breaking them up into these pieces. Um, just wanted to bring that part into the overview of my work. Um, my slides are not progressing. Um, yeah. And then these images are from uh, my mid -res show at CalArts. As Minga said, we met there during our grad school time. Um, so talking again, just all the different ways that textiles are like a part of our domestic space. And this whole show is sort of like a replication of that. Um, I see the front space is sort of a living area and then you have a kitchen dining area um, as you rotate around the exhibition. Um, you can, oh, why is it? There we go. Um, you can see sort of like then they're in the back there becomes sort of an inside outside and um, yeah so just all the different spaces in the home that relate to the body and have the textiles. Um, 
And then here I have some sculptures um, that, as I said before, just that our space, our body is always so in motion. So somehow like defining that or capturing that space um, is a big part of the way that I'm working with these materials. Um, and then in the pandemic, I was finally able to get my floor loom up and running. So the last few slides are just some experiments with the, the weavings that I've been making over the last year and a half, um, which then is crossing over into a painting practice where I take the paintings and weave with them. Um, so this is a little video of sort of a more complicated one. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, and these last two slides are just recent works in progress um, that all have to do with textiles and painting. And that's it for me. <laughs> Beautiful, thanks so much, Casey, and, and thank you to all presenters, um, James, Ari, Felicia, Minga. Um, that was really wonderful. Um, as I mentioned, we really wanted to just like flood this space with so many different ideas, so many different approaches, um, intentions, explorations, um, and visuals, and then uh, give you all um, the space of a smaller breakout room to maybe share your thoughts, meet some of the other audience members. Um, so we will head into those now for the next 10 minutes. Um, feel free to opt out. You can also take this moment as a real break. Um, I know we just sat through almost an hour of um, just continuous presentation. So if you want to step away from your computer for a minute, um, that's totally fine too. Uh, I also want to ask for those of you who do have questions to maybe take this break room as a moment also to share your questions um, and maybe refine them so that when we enter into our Q&A session um, after, I want to say let's limit these in the interest of time to about 10 minutes. So after 10 minutes, if you want to bring those questions back into this space, um, we'll have um, a moment until sort of the end of the program to really just have an open, large conversation. Um, so any second now, we'll head into those break rooms.
Great. I think we are back. How are those break rooms? Did they work? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Um, does anyone have a question they're just like itching to ask to, to the large group? Or um, was there anything you were talking about in your break room that you think would be nice to bring to this larger group? Okay. If not, I will maybe um, ask a question. Last call. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> I guess um, this might be a little long-winded. Um, I'm kind of just riffing here a little, but I think something that connected a lot of um, the presentations today that I found really wonderful was this sort of like intersection and overlapping of sort of like craft prototyping technology um, as sort of um, methods and, and approaches that really like also just jumped scale. Um, so, you know, like James showing the prototyping uh, with the debris netting that is used um, for Veilcraft, uh, Felicia showing sort of these like prototype um, swatches almost and um, the, the jump to sort of the wall paneling. Um, and then even like Minga, your experimentation with mushrooms and everything. And um, I think Ari, you like spoke very directly about the sort of like um, entanglements and connections between craft history and technological history. And, and so I guess I'm wondering since, you know, we're in this context of, of posting this as a kind of architecture space along with craft contemporary, um, I'm wondering if you all actively think about these different histories, often very, you know, gendered or class-based um, cultural histories of craft. Um, Maybe more so for the architects, this is the question, because I feel like the artists, um, the, the craft is much more present. Um, but then also, I guess, for the artists, I, I think when working with textile, um, you're thinking much more almost like tectonically, I guess is the term we would use in architecture, where you're thinking about how pieces join and come together. And um, you're thinking a lot about structure. Um, and so I. Yeah, I guess if you all could maybe speak to the kind of like mirroring and back and forth um, and uh, relationships between both like craft technology and, and architecture. Um. I, I guess I could take a stab at it. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, uh, let's see, where, where to start? Um, in, I guess in response to the question of scale, that was, that was always something that um, uh, was a huge challenge. It, this is by far the largest thing we've made. Um, you know, it's, it's 30 feet tall, it's thousands of uh, square feet of uh, fabric. And so um, the economy of scale was, uh, was an incredible uh, kind of logistics challenge, um, you know, in terms of like making it, um, uh, pleating it, hemming it, transporting it. Um, and in that sense, um, we really had to grapple or, sort of um, uh, find a technique, uh, find a series of uh, steps um, that was as simple as possible while uh, producing a kind of um, uh, still a compelling overall effect. And, and there's, there's certainly terror in that because you can never, you can, you can mock up as much as, can but 
the, that will never equal to the sort of full scale uh, thing. Like, you know, we, our, our little mock-up scaffolding was already 12 feet tall, but how does it look when it's 30 feet tall? Um, that's, that's something you have to discover in real time. And, and if things don't look good, uh, you kind of have to uh, really um, act quickly to, to uh, change things. Um, I think in terms of technology, the question of technology, I think this project for us um, was interesting in that we couldn't really employ the typical technologies that an architect would use um, just because we're so used to drawing everything to kind of exact dimensions and understanding tolerances in terms of like, uh, you know, quarter of an inch, eighth of an inch, but with fabric, you, you really can't draw it uh, in a way that um, reflects the, the certain um, characteristics of the material, like the way it drapes, the, um, the way things stretch. Uh, and then also in the inherent, you know, structure of the scaffolding, there are errors in that as well. And it, it's, that's what makes fabric and textiles kind of remarkable is that I feel like craft is something that you do in real time and you are, you're manipulating and adjusting. And, you know, we, we were, um, constantly discovering, um, moments that we had to, uh, you know, shift the design and, and this doesn't work. Let's try this uh, other thing. And so the trial and error, um, figures into that as well. And then, um, why don't I just stop there and let some um, other people yeah. speak? The that is brought to mind is the, uh, the work of Frank Gehry and how he used chain link fence in his architecture. And chain link is like a textile, the way that it's woven together. And he used it in his Santa Monica Place parking lot. And he used it in some of his residential architecture. And it influenced a whole generation of architects, but it never became the mainstream. Well, um, this is uh, Joe Coriati. I'm an architect. I'm the managing partner of Frederick Fisherman Partners. And I, I wanted to say that I think there's a number of ways. There was a question in the group that I was in that breakout about um, why are architects celebrated and maybe artists aren't. And I'm wondering if in our kind of post COVID time, if we could think of textiles and fabric as a way to blur the boundaries, we're all realizing how, especially in Los Angeles, we spend so much time outside now, restaurants, workspace, our homes. And is there a way that fabric could be used that allows us to kind of have it be a little bit more fluid. And when I sat in the Veilcraft installation the other night at an opening at the, or conversation at the museum, it was very much like that. It had created a really wonderful space between the building and Wilshire. And it was a space that had quite a bit of containment and character, yet it was very open. And how could fabric be used as the boundaries or perimeter of a building in the traditional way of people that occupied this land 10,000 years ago. I actually have a follow-up question for James. Um, I was wondering if you had worked with textiles before Veilcraft. You may have mentioned this in your presentation, but maybe I didn't quite catch it. And I was wondering if working with textiles changed your perception with them or your attitude toward them or um, you're just your general thinking about them. And did you look to establish textile practices like from sewing? Because like sewing has this established method of using patterns and ways of drawing patterns and using that to, to port an idea over into the actual physical material of a cloth. And I, did you look to any of those to, to manage some of your processes when you're prototyping? Uh, this was our first textile project. So we're coming um, from a standpoint of like complete lack of knowledge. 
Um, and you know, we we started when we started the project. We it was it was much more about looking at just construction aesthetics and um, how to uh, sort of take that and, and turn it on its head um, and reframe it in certain ways. So the fabric component, the importance of the fabric component came a little bit later. Um, and, and certainly we started um, researching that um, and, and we, we learned a lot, but I think there's still much more to be explored. Um, and we kind of, we're just enthralled and delighted in the process. And um, it also, I think textiles and this project um, really changes the way we think about the production of work or production of, of, of um, the artwork, because um, it, I think the material and the, the techniques don't allow you to sit back and dictate. In, in the sort of normative relationship that an architect has with, let's say a building um, where you just, you draw and then you tell somebody else to completely produce it. And um, there's that kind of divorce. Uh, whereas in, I think any project that has um, a super specific textile technique, I, I think you just have to get uh, hands-on with it. And I think that's, that's really delightful. And I hope that, um, I hope that changes the way that we do work um, in the future, whether it's textile based or not. Yeah, just adding on to, to what you're just saying, um, that one of the things I've enjoyed about working with textiles is that your body is in it um, from the beginning and you are 100% there and you need to pay attention uh, to, what's, to what's going on. And it's also a concern um, because they are so labor intensive. Many of these things are hugely, they just take weeks. Whereas if you could figure out, once you figure out your prototype, how to get it manufactured, you could cut down some of the time, but the labor is somewhat worrying because, um, you know, textiles have this huge problem of not paying people properly, like kind of inequitable labor practice. And, and so there's this fine line um, where the craft needs to flip over to something else when you get at scale um, to think also about how to be equitable about labor and, and how, to, how to deal with that, so. And then I had a question for James too. I was wondering how did it feel to be in the space surrounded by fabric as opposed to if you were surrounded by walls of other materials, should uh, well, you know, we we try to use the fabric, the the construction material, um, in a way that created associations with um, domestic spaces, and you know, I think it, Casey's work um, touches upon some of that as well. Like, I mean, everybody's work really, because. I feel like fabric is one of those materials where the, the association of it with certain experiences and sensations um, it is much more overt than, than let's say walls. Like I feel like concrete doesn't do that. And so like I'm, you know, like Felicia's um, uh, panel where it just invites you to touch or to be closer to um, that material. I think I think you know that was something that we were trying to produce uh, in in the in the sensation or experience. I also wanted to add in our group um, and through this presentation, one of the things that came to mind was. Um, Annie Albers's um, essay, The Pliable Plane, Textiles in Architecture. And I'm gonna go ahead and drop that for everyone here um, on the chat through the Albers Foundation that they have the entire uh, writing there. And it was, it was interesting because there's there's a few things that have resonated with me. One of them is the disconnection to, to materiality and the making of, of something where um, with both with both architecture and textiles, there's there's an aspect of construction where each part remains 
um, kind of part of a bigger thing, but their individuality and their materiality kind of uh, remains within itself versus something made out of clay or made out of metal where the entire materiality is encompassed in one object, which I found really interesting. And the other the other thing is um, there, I kind of, I, with Annie's, uh, Annie Albers' um, essay, it kind of draws it all the way back to this instance of, of, of how fabric and fiber uh, in early kind of uh, human evolution was the shelter. Um, and it was that pliable plane that we took with us. And almost there was almost this like two duality um, and everything is framework around the body and, and, and seeking shelter and creating shelter for the body where there is both the, the, the architectural space as shelter, but then also the clothing that we constantly wear throughout our daily life as shelter as well. Um, and there's also something interesting, which I, I, I think this conversation kind of like upends it, but, um, the first sentence in that essay is, um, if the nature of architecture is grounded, the fixed, the permanent, then the textiles are its very antithesis, uh, which I think a project like the one that uh, James has, cre has created and which multiple of you have created the, uh, in, in this presentation, I'll really unwrap, unwrap not to, uh, not to make a pun, but really unravels that 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 comment of 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 not creating kind of like a binary, but how there are these 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 blurry spaces where where one can inhabit uh, or or inhabit a materiality or a space through kind of different modes. It's interesting that you mentioned how architecture is thought of as permanent and textiles are not permanent. Because as um, Mingo was showing us, certain textiles like the polyester plastic based ones are kind of permanent and, and you have to do a lot to make them go away. And so even there, our, our conceptions of what's permanent and what's not permanent are actually faulty. I feel like I have to say that construction textiles are plastic-based products. Um, and so I'm hoping Manga can help us figure out how her mushrooms can eat all of the textiles <laughs> after we're done. Um, yeah, and to, to, I would love to help you. Um, but to like keep talking about like, I, I'm thinking like when you think of textiles, you think of this soft, like flowy material, but also like, it, it, to me, what was really interesting, I did a, a deal a lot with weight, like it, all the textiles are so heavy when you put them all together. And all my sculptures, like moving my sculptures in and out of places, it's, it's like insane. Um, so thinking about like how to make that back to like their original feeling of like textiles just like decomposing is like what I'm trying to. Um, but I'm excited to help you and maybe we can get some mushrooms eating the, <laughs> the installation. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to unmute for a second. So I, I have seen discussions where people are, you know, like making bales and then they become uh, uh, pieces that are put together um, in, um, in architecture. So they're used as building materials. So that's a whole other, you know, like people are doing stuff with hay bales. Why can't they do it with fabric bales? Um, I forgot. To, yeah, I totally forgot about to mention that um, a lot of people are using clothing as an insulation in buildings. Um, the thing is that clothing is very heavy. So it depends the structure, I mean, an architecture would be better answering this. <laughs> but as a, a, a environmental standpoint, they are using recycled textiles in many different ways right now. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know if as an architect, you can respond to this more. <laughs> to me, it's the, the 21st century, century equivalent of an adobe brick, for example, on some, yeah. Right, and that also reminds me of the fact that even though we we think of architecture as being permanent, actually isn't. It's just, it lives at a longer time scale than a human lifespan in a lot of cases. Wow. And there are many cases in which architecture has a shorter lifespan than a human. It's just that I think we like to put things in boxes and say, 
this is something that's permanent, this is something that's impermanent, but there are so many gray areas in between. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a question sent in by Elizabeth Stevenson um, for Ari and Felicia, although I think this can also maybe be opened to others. Um, the question is, can you comment on how virtual reality tools might be employed in terms of vision and touch? Um, and uh, I think we can just open this up to kind of this conversation about the sensorial that we've kind of been been um, circling. And so uh, she also asks, is there anyone working on this that we could know about? I have a student who's just starting literally <laughs> on Monday who uh, will be working on that topic. He's really interested on in what we can learn from soft materials, materials that transform under some kind of pressure or manipulation um, in a virtual or augmented reality environment. And that's about all I know about it right now. He's starting it. Um, but I think that typically in virtual reality, there's always this gap in between what your body is doing and what something else is doing outside of the virtual reality. And so that is an interesting moment to negotiate with the kind of spanning of the media between something real, like a textile that you can feel and touch and, and then something that you're, you're making. Um, but certainly it could be really interesting and useful to maybe try to see like how, like how humans actually, like what is it in fact that we perceive from textiles when we touch them by taking it into virtuality to find that kind of wall. Um, and so it could reveal something interesting to us about human intelligence uh, that way. So a uh, really interesting question. That is a super interesting question. And I have to say for self that I'm not I've not done a lot of VR. I've like put on a headset maybe half a dozen times in my life. And it's a really inter interesting experience. And I know that it, at, least, um, at least early on, perhaps this is still the case, there's this disconnect when you put on a headset and you're not used to it. And um, a lot of people get headaches. Like I started getting a headache because it's just really hard for your brain to absorb this information when I think the rest of your your eye in one set of information and the rest of your senses are taking in different information. And it's just a really hard gap to overcome. And I think it's interesting to think about, we, we accelerate certain kinds of technologies that privilege certain senses, like the sense of sight or the sense of sound, but not necessarily the sense of touch or smell or taste or maybe your kinesthetic sense. And why is that? Why do we do this? We live in a very sight, sound, privileged world. Uh, I'll just quickly add that I feel like that, that sense of touch becomes actually super important in a VR world because that's how, that's the only way we maintain sort of, or we are grounded in a, in a literal sense. And I think fabric is like absolutely, um, the because it's it's got certain properties like elasticity and it, there's like certain feedback that you get um when you push against fabric that you know if for instance um you know i'm thinking in terms of like let's say gaming where if your controller can provide that feedback through um fabric or if your environment you know you see all these you see videos of people running into things when they're in VR because they don't know their surroundings. So like if somehow the environment or what you still touch can have that type of feedback, um, that could be super interesting. And that like when, when I see like microprocessors and conductive thread being woven into those and thinking that, you know, these electronics or interfaces 
if they don't have to be plastic or metal and they could be fabric based, that could be just incredible. Maybe in an alternate universe, computers would have been made out of fabric and we'd be donning uh, virtual reality suits instead of headsets. All this um, sort of talk of the touch of it all, and also because Andres put, in, put out in Annie Elber's um, sensibility, there's a thing, there's a quote of hers that I really like that says, our sense of touch is left idle, and with it, those formative faculties that are stimulated by it. We touch the things to assure ourselves of reality. We touch the objects of our love. We touch the things we form. Um, so to me, that talks about touch and form in a really like, I don't know, symbiotic way. Um, I've always really liked that quote. I think these are some super beautiful thoughts to end on. Um, we're a little over time, so I wanna move to wrap up um, unless anyone's got like any like absolute last minute thoughts they want to share um, hey I just have a I just have a plug um, yes do it. craft contemporary is uh, it will be host as part of uh, all the MA um, and Bale craft programming craft contemporary the, we will be hosting a few other programs one of which is a workshop by Minga Ofaso and Casey Baden, which is, I just dropped the link. Uh, if any of you are interested, the title of the workshop is Deconstructing the Garment. And this will be, this it's, it's a, there's only limited capacity to this workshop because it will be in person. And we do require that everybody who's attending um, provide proof of vaccination. And it will be in the courtyard inside of Veilcraft, in the Veilcraft space. and. Uh, Minga will be bringing uh, some of some of the, the the clothing that she's been collecting, and and Casey and both Casey and Minga will be kind of teaching a few different techniques on how to deconstruct them and reconstruct them into something different. So y'all are welcome to join us for that. That's my plug. Thanks, Andres, for telling everyone about our workshop. <laughs> A little earlier, I made a comment, but I didn't realize I was on mute until I was finished with the comment. So I just want to go back and say it. And that is about how um, wood, a construction material in architecture, is also a material that makes paper, which makes a form of textiles. And so that's just something that in one area where they overlap. Definitely. But when we, when we think of textiles, we, I think we think of uh, the practical in the form of clothing and upholstery, but we, and then we think of it in the form of art. Whereas with architecture, it is an applied art and in art also, but it, it just seems to be much more recognized as an applied art than textiles does. Well, and that was stated before. To what you're saying, Carolyn, um, Shigeru Ban's paper architecture um, really comes to, to mind with that, that there's so many different things that you can do with paper pulp um, to achieve different strengths and ways of using it from the plane until a block of, or a brick or so what you're saying is absolutely right really interesting and also paper is used for window coverings in a lot of cultures including asian a lot of east asian cultures yeah i think that's a um really great note to to end on um kind of challenging all of us to shift our our perspectives and assumptions about material um, to, to shift our assumptions about the permanence of architecture and the impermanence of textile and to really sort of like collapse a lot of these understandings, which I feel like all the work that we saw today um, also did a really great job of getting us to sort of like think about and, and sort of question. So um, on that note, I wanna say uh, thank you so much to Ari, Casey, Minga, James, and Felicia. 
Um, and thank you to Andres uh, for, you know, co-hosting and co-organizing everyone at Craft, um, everyone at MA. Um, I think uh, Gary's here, Aubrey's here, Shoop, um, Mateus for, for running the Zoom. Um, I hope you all have a really wonderful weekend. Um, and this was such a great way to start it off.